Roger, let's now focus on a retrospective of your views of cosmology, your obviously contrarian views, challenging the conventional wisdom of the standard model of the lambda cold dark matter model of cosmology, inflation, the beginning of the universe. So walk me through the process by which you um, have, uh, that you now feel, uh, that you now challenge the, the conventional wisdom. Well, I'd been puzzled for a long time about the very specialness of the Big Bang. And I'd sort of phrased it in different ways, a thing I call the vile curvature hypothesis, merely a hypothesis, then we get the vile curvature, that's the conformal part of the curvature, that's the gravitational degrees of freedom, if you like, had to be suppressed right at the beginning for some reason unknown. And so that was the sort of view I held without having a good explanation. The next part of the story, really, uh, my former student, Paul Todd, played a big role here because he was looking at his particular way of thinking about the specialness of the Big Bang and how do you say it? And his way of saying it, I'd sort of bit thought about this before, but not really. He was the one, I give him credit because he told of this idea. He was thinking of a way of saying how the Big Bang was special. And this was to say, that if you conformally stretch it out, so you change the scale, you don't change the metric any other respect apart from the, the scale of the metric. So it's important to think about that. The I like to think of the metric is defined basically by two things. One is the light cone. So this is, tells you what the speed of light is, how does the light work. And the other is how clocks behave. And if you like, it's nine out of 10 components which tell you how the light waves work and only one which gives you the scale. So it's the one which is the conformal structure. And if you say you don't have that one, you have conformal geometry. You don't know how big things are. You don't know how long time scales are. And what determines the scale of time, if you like, is mass. And that comes from the two most famous formulae of 20th century physics, Einstein's E equals MC squared, of course, and Max Planck's even slightly older, E equals H nu, or HF, some people call it. H is Planck's constant, and F or nu is frequency. Einstein tells you that energy and mass are equivalent. Planck tells you that energy and frequency are equivalent. That to put the two together, that tells you that mass and frequency are equivalent. So any massive particle is a clock. And mm. that's the best way of saying it. Now, if you don't have any mass, such as in the remote future, when it's very, maybe you don't have anything but photons and things like that, there's a bit of a stretch, but let's say you don't have any mass. And there's another argument which you have to supplant it with. I won't go into that for the moment. Then you might say that in the remote future, you don't really know what the scale is. And this conformal geometry where you squash and stretch is really the way of talking about the universe. Now, what about the Big Bang? And here's where Paul Todd comes in, because he was looking at how do you characterize the very special nature of the Big Bang, that it doesn't have any vile curvature, it doesn't have any conformal curvature. How do you say that? Well, you say that when you stretch it out, it makes a nice smooth boundary. So that was his skin. Can say, let's do work it out. Let's work with the Big Bang. It's special by saying, stretch it out and look at its conformal geometry. And he had a way of doing it, looking at the Big Bang this way, which he'd worked out himself. Very good piece of work. And I picked up on that. I made it a little more special than his because I needed to match it to the world future. So I wanted to say the Big Bang, I mean, this was this crazy thought I'd had, lying on the floor somewhere, I think. I, I, I think yeah. I had my, some of my good ideas lying on the floor. This was one of them. Um, for some reason, I had this thought that the remote future looks awfully like the Big Bang. When you're looking at it conformally, if you don't have any mass around it, either state for some reason, and it's actually much more clear why you don't have any mass around it, the Big Bang, than the remote future. Why is it so clear? It's so clear because it's so hot. Everything is moving around so fast that the energy in the particles is almost entirely in their kinetic energy. The mass energy is ridiculously trivial. 
In fact, in the limit, as you go back into the Big Bang, it disappears completely. You're really thinking about massless things in the remote past, in the Big Bang. And I had an argument in the remote future, which is less convincing, perhaps for a good reason. <laughs> but nevertheless, that was the argument. But in the both ends, mm. Big Bang and the remote future, you really have a conformal thing. And so then the next step was to think, well, maybe the Big Bang was the conformal continuation of something, the remote future of a pre previous cosmic eon. Mm. And our remote future will turn out to be the Big Bang of the next cosmic eon. Mm. So it really is more uh, a vision of the uh, uh, conformal cyclical cosmology that that energized you as opposed to looking at the conventional wisdom of the uh, lambda cold dark matter as something wrong with it. So it's it, 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 so, so it's the excitement of this new idea as opposed to the problem of the old idea. Well, the old idea doesn't, you see, you're stuck with inflation. Right. Inflation, I never liked for various reasons. But um, you see, you need to, you get causality problems, you see, without without something which brings that things a bit into cause, causal contact, which seem to be in, in the way the universe evolves. So you seem to have to have inflation if you don't have a previous eon. And I didn't like the idea of inflation for various reasons. I can't know that I could explain them at the moment. I don't even know if I, <laughs> they're necessarily good reasons. But I never liked inflation. And I thought, this is much better. And it would explain the causal connections with things which are outside your causal boundary. And you don't need inflation for that. Uh, and. Uh, to risk sounding a little glib, uh, in either model, you need some kind of magic. <laughs> in, uh, what do you mean by magic? Well, I mean, comes in what, what I mean is something that's yes. a radically, a radically uh, disturbing idea to the to our normal conception. I mean, conform, okay. conf, uh, uh, conformal cyclical cosmology, where you lose the time scale, is a remarkable idea. I mean, it's a it's it's yeah. a magical idea. I use that in a very positive way. As as is, is inflation, each has yeah. has their own charm, but they're they're <laughs> radical ideas. Your your model in explaining the initial conditions of the Big Bang and the, the vision is uh, is an important one. I mean, right or not, at this point is not as important as the the, the contribution of uh, of radically uh, uh, um, uh, a, a radical explanation that has an internal coherence to it. As you described, uh, in terms of losing the scale in the in the in the model, and, and so yes. I think it's a remarkable contribution. Um, let, let me ask you this: I mean, you 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 have famously said that you personally are not a religious believer. You don't believe in established religions of any kind, but you also say, I think, that the universe has a, a purpose. Uh, um, that it's that it's not total chance. Is that correct? And what then would you mean by purpose uh, or or teleology? Uh, yes, I remember confessing to some sort of purpose. Depends. He put quotes on the purpose somehow, I suppose. Um, right. <clears throat> that's a good question. I mean, a universe without conscious beings in it. Does that count as a universe? I suppose it's that kind of a thing. You might say that you could have a universe without conscious beings, but does it really count as a universe? Because it doesn't conjure itself into existence without being observed in some sense. I'm not sure to what extent this is like a religious view. It, I don't know. You, you might, I suppose this is tied up with the constants of nature. You might say, look, these constants of nature, and they all seem to be rather curious and arbitrary, and we don't know why we've got these different numbers which are hanging around in particle physics, and they look as though they might have been chosen to have these values because of by God or something like that. And that could be a view. That's certainly not my view. 
What is my view? That's a good question. Well, the typical view today, of course, is the multiverse, uh, which uh, with a selection mechanism, we can only know the the, the, the the one out of the zillions of possible universes in the multiverse in which we exist, so we think it's special. Um, but 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 you don't like the multiverse either. <laughs> no, we there are different kinds of multiverse. You could have them that they sort of branch into each other, I suppose. I mean, that's the the many worlds type of picture that they mm. sort of branch into each other in some way. Yeah, that's I mean, there, I did have a positive uh, uh, light, time in my life where I was keen on that idea, and how short it was, I can't remember, but not long. <laughs> <laughs> but um. Uh, no, but but it, it, it's it's interesting to explore uh, the, the concept of purpose without a, a religious or or, or a theological uh, element to it. W what does that mean, and does it mean having conscious beings as part of that, which is what you you sort of speculate on, um, as opposed to consciousness being kind of a random accident of evolution that just happened to appear in this in this universe. I think there's a confusion here about, about whether there's some virtue involved. I mean, is there goodness? You see, people think of virtue, the mm. purpose in some sense, is connected with being good. Mm. I suppose that's that's the thing, and I don't see that connection. I mean, I pity. Yeah, yeah. Nice uh, axiology uh, <laughs> yes. is is a is a definite theory. Uh, John Leslie, uh, a philosopher, uh, has uh, expounded on that. Uh, others, yeah. others as well. Um, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm with you. I don't, I don't see that having the, the abstract nature of goodness uh, having a, a, a causative power to bring things about. Although it sounds nice. I suppose there is. I mean, I don't see much evidence in the world we have <laughs> now. <laughs> I suppose there is a fair... Uh, the trouble is that the balance, it's not so much that there's an awful lot of badness in the world, but there's some way in which the badness seems to gain uh, uh, power, put it like that. That there's a way in which... Um, yes, I don't know. I, I, I don't want to moralize because I don't think, I don't think it's, I can moralize. I think I need to be a different person to moralize on these topics. <laughs> <laughs> I only think that that there is no purpose in the sense of goodness. That mm. is to say that we're all striving for a wonderful um, paradise in the future. I don't see a necessity for that happening, unfortunately. I'd rather like to think that, but I don't see that, no. Thank you for watching. If you like this video, please like and comment below. You can support Closer to Truth by subscribing. Closer to Truth is now accepting your tax-exempt donations. Please come to closertotruth.com forward slash donate. Thank you very much for supporting us and thanks for watching.